would not be available from almost any other source because the uh, NASA's not, there is some radar, some skin track, but these small pieces are probably too small and too close to the shuttle to show up on radar, but they would show up to the visual observers. So now, this is critically important. Now let me ask you and Norm Thagard to put that information we've just got together with the following information. The final radio transmission just before 9 o'clock between Mission Control and the shuttle gave no indication of any trouble. I'll read it to you. Mission Control, Columbia, Houston, we see your tire pressure messages and we did not copy your last. Columbia's commander, Roger, buh, and then the transmission goes silent for several seconds, followed by static. Any relationship between the two? Because the California pass with these things appearing behind it would have occurred several minutes earlier, right? Well, it doesn't really rule out other possibilities. It does start leading you in the direction of that it, this is not computer problems or things like that. This is loss of some kind of structure that uh, that's occurring early, and uh, when you get down lower, you can't sustain uh, significant losses of tile. That's Norm Thagard, by the way, not Jim Weber. Norm, what do you make of the uh, of what Mr. Beasley had to say from California? Well, again, Jim indicated uh, this. This says that something was coming off the shuttle far earlier than what happened over Texas would suggest, and it it leads, I think, in the direction of feeling that. It was tile loss or some uh, some sort of structural loss like that that was more likely to be a cause, but it still doesn't rule out other possibilities. And, and if you were Mr. Beasley looking up with the naked eye in the Owens Valley this morning, would you, and, and you'd seen what he described, would you have come to the conclusion? I would have come to the conclusion that something was coming off the shuttle and that this is definitely not a normal situation because this doesn't happen on, uh, on other entries. Okie doke. Thank you all very much. And just to repeat what Mr. Beasley said, as it tracked from west to east over the Owens Valley, it was leaving a bright trail. As it actually moved over the valley, there were a couple of flashes, and then we could see there were things clearly trailing the orbiter subsequent to that. Anthony Beasley, an astronomer from the California Institute of Technology, calling us uh, this morning. Um, the president. It may be that people who have... Uh, just joined us. Um, can't believe anybody is unaware of what has happened in the in the life of the country today with uh, STS-107, the Columbia shuttle having uh, come apart uh, just as it was re-entering the at Earth's atmosphere just before nine o'clock Eastern time, eight o'clock Central time this morning with the loss of seven lives at about 200,000 feet, 40 miles up into the air. No clear answer from NASA yet, but these little clues that keep popping up, and naturally they involve a measure of speculation popping up from around the country, which we hope we'll get some verification of or knockdown from NASA uh, when they brief, I believe, almost now. But ABC's Lynn Schur has an observation. Lynn. Peter, I've been speaking to uh, Brian Cantwell, who's the head of the Department of Aeronautics and um, Astronautics at Stanford, and he makes the point uh, regarding the tiles that we um, we saw the loss of tiles before on the shuttle. I remember when I covered the early launches of Columbia, there were at least one or two where there were tile losses on liftoff. They had cameras, they looked at them, they examined them, they determined that was not a problem. That's because they were not uh, what Professor Cantwell calls these so-called killer tiles. If the tiles are in the critical places, that's when the zipper effect happens. All tiles do not, or, or, all tiles are not equal. So the question is, was it those tiles that were damaged on liftoff this time? Were they something else? But the point is the, the shuttle can indeed sustain the loss of some tiles. The issue is where those tiles are, Peter. Okay, Lynn, thank you very much. So we learn, always happens in an occasion uh, like this. So of course, there are not other occasions like this. You learn so much more about something you have taken casually. And not all ties are, tiles are equal is clearly something we have learned today. As we look at, uh, everybody's so familiar with the shuttle now that that, um, that uh, we almost don't need to hold it up. But it's this it's this undersurface, of course, which Jim Oberg and and others have and Jim Slade have helped us understand this morning. John Nance ensure that uh, that this is critical areas here, and it was on it was on it was on liftoff. Let me turn it around again. It was on liftoff when when they saw on videotape something peeling back about the size of a door 
Jim Oberg described it. And he thought it might even have been a piece of ice or it may have been some insulation material and clipped on to the left wing. And we put that together now with what appears to be, I apologize for the speculation if it's totally, if it's not well informed, this, what appears to be this zipper effect of tiles perhaps streaming out or something coming off, as Norm Thaggard says, something coming off the shuttle you know, over quite close to the coast of California, over the Sierra Nevadas and the White Mountains in northern California. Um, NASA about to brief, the president having briefed. Um, the independent investigation. Um, yeah, several people have, have, have pointed out how important this has been for the relationship between NASA and the public in terms of, of um, confidence. And Sean O'Keefe, who was the current NASA administrator who went there from the Office of Management and Budget in order to focus very much on NASA's expenses and its management, not, not, a, not a man from, from the space program or from the military in this regard, uh, appointed an independent board on today to investigate the space shuttle disaster. Um, experts from the Army and the Air Force and the Navy in this case, who had five of the seven crew members on board, will join officials from the Transportation Department and other federal agencies on the review panel and the idea, John Nance is with us, our aviation specialist. John, the real value of an independent investigation like this is? Well, it's been that no body can corrupt it, no matter right. how hard they try. And not that anybody wants to corrupt this one, but human nature is human nature. And you don't want to gore the ox of your friend. We've had this problem in the U.S. military for many years, and we still don't have an independent investigatory agency. NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, is reasonably independent. They've done a wonderful job. It, this is the right thing to do, to have an independent investigatory authority. And again, it's not because we think people are going to cheat. It's because human nature dictates that, that you pull punches at times that you don't really intend to. John, uh, when we're on the air as much as we are at the moment, we, we, we end up revisiting things. But revisit for us, you would, the three members of the International Space Station at the moment. They have an escape vehicle actually at the space station. The Russians have a Soyuz capacity on the ground that could go and get them. And as I asked, I've forgotten who was I asked earlier, how would you be feeling if you're one of the three up there at the moment? You know, I think uh, I probably am accurate in this uh, to the extreme. Their thoughts are going to be uh, with the comrades they lost, with the families, uh, with the, the impact on the system more than with themselves because they know they've got that escape capsule out there and they know they're going to be all right. Were that not the case, but we're dependent on the shuttles uh, and, and let's say this was uh, down to grounding only one remaining shuttle, I, I think maybe they, their thoughts would turn to themselves. But these folks are up there and kind of a selfless endeavor in many instances. Uh, I, somebody made, one of the astronauts, maybe it was uh, Eugene Cernan made the uh, statement a little while ago that you're not up there for money, you're, you're up there with this, this great purpose in mind. And I know that's what they're feeling. Uh, anybody on the cutting edge of discovery is, is in that mode. Now, I, I don't know if we've got anybody with us. I may go back to Jim Oberg this, but this is called Expedition 6, I think, the current mission to the space station. It's two Americans, one Russian went up in November, coming, scheduled to come down in March. Uh, who can help me on that one? Jim? Jim Oberg? Here. Can you hear me? Yes, I apologize. I, okay. I, I, I throw so much at you and you and Norm and John, but uh, such as it. I'm talking about the, the International Space Station. Yeah, there are two Americans and one Russian up there? That's right, and they're, they're, they're fine. And in fact, the escape capsule is really just a Soyuz, and the Russians replace them every six months so that the options for the station are, are fairly benign for the, for the next, next few months. There is a replacement uh, of that vehicle taking place in the end of April. They could easily send up the next expedition crew aboard that Soyuz because they, there are two cosmonauts and an astronaut. They could easily fly the Soyuz mm -hmm. and, and stay there for six months, uh, get supplies from the Russian supply ships. One is being launched this weekend. And so the station can basically just uh, quiet, quiet itself down, uh, and stop the construction for a while until the shuttles fly again. And, uh, but there's not, a, not an issue. The, uh, the Soyuz and the progress system from the Russians can support uh, the station, ma manning the station for at least another year. So let me turn to Norm Thaggard for a second, because STS-107, the Columbia mission, did not visit the space station. I gather it didn't visit the space station because it was heavy and it was just simply on another mission. And the loss of one of America's space shuttles does what, Norm, do you think, to the international space program? It probably doesn't affect the International Space Station program too much. The Columbia, as you've already heard, was not involved in the rotation right. of crews or supplies to the station. 
it you lose flexibility because to the extent that you had missions that didn't involve the International Space Station, you probably uh, are, have compromised the ability to perform those missions. One of the things I was thinking this morning is on Columbia this time, uh, there were a number of experiments uh, having, that had been sponsored by American business and there have been on previous shuttles. This must this will make people very wary about investing clearly in the space program when when we have something like we had today i'm not sure it does that everyone in, it isn't only the astronauts that in, understand the risk the people that would put payloads on the shuttle understand the risk is as well uh, there are investigators who put years of their lives into developing experiments for the shuttle or for the station and then for one reason or another uh, you saw it with the challenger accident uh, don't fly those programs. So when you go into the space program, you understand that there is this sort of risk involved. And we will, I hope, get, I'll ask somebody if we could get a list of the experiments that were done on the Columbia on this particular 16-day mission. 16 days ago this mission began, and the saddest thing, and there's so much sad about this today, but the sadness of hearing the families today including uh, many of uh, several of the astronauts with children waiting virtually at the end of the runway in Florida for the uh, for the crews to come back after a mission that had had just appeared to be picture perfect and you heard people saying at NASA early today they had been so enthusiastic during the downlinks uh, the daily television time that is given to the astronauts and the press and their families to talk to people on these missions. It's such an intimate experience for so many people now. In the early days of space, guys went up, and they were, of course, only guys in those days. And they, uh, and they, you know, they sort of, we, Kate, we got voices. We got the famous voice of John Glenn uh, when he went up for the first time, and and Neil Armstrong when he landed on the moon. But now, the television, which NASA very calculatingly put on board a lot of the space vehicles so that the public could stay in touch, so the public would stay enthusiastic about the space program in America, which politicians were always threatening in some way or another, um, has kept the public and particularly the families very deeply connected. Back to Nacogdoches in Texas, where ABC's Mike Von Fremd is in the middle, I gather, of the debris field. Mike, what have you got? Peter, this is the center of town of Nacogdoches, and a piece actually fell right in the parking lot of the Commercial Bank of Texas. The National Guard has sealed it off. It doesn't look like it's any larger to me than about three feet by two feet, Peter. Mike. It looks like it's part of the heat shield. Can you hear me? Mike, I apologize. I was told to cut you off, and I don't intend to cut you off for a second, but I may have to cut you off if the briefing starts, so I apologize. Please continue. I'll, I'll be happy to stop any time, but there's a, the, most of the people of town have come here to take a peek at it, but many of them have been telling me, Peter, that they've uh, had pieces in their own backyard, and the National Guard and the police here are trying to put up these rope lines across it so that nobody takes a souvenir home. That's, uh, that's one of the things they want to guard against. Of course, they've been warned not to touch it. But this piece, as I was telling you, looks a little like part of the heat shield. Uh, if we've got time, I'm going to bring one of the locals in here. Jerry Schultz, come to me. You tell me that you got a frantic call from your daughter uh, today saying, Dad, come over quick. What did she tell you? Well, she said she had something that fell in her backyard and called authorities. They come out, and I just went out and looked at it. And to me, it looks like part of the heat shield. It still has some, like, seven-inch squares on it. And did the authorities come out and rope it off, or did they yeah. just tell you to leave it alone? Or They roped it off and just told they'd be back in touch. Well, and you're not There's three different pieces in the in the field. And, and you don't think people here are going to want to keep these for souvenirs, right? They want to help the authorities gather as much of this stuff as they can? I think so. I, uh, on the way out there, I see people walking in their pastures. Uh, you know, everybody's out looking, trying to see what they can find. I saw a lot of debris coming in the past 20 miles. In your pasture and stuff, are you describe what you're seeing to me. Are you seeing many particles? Um, one of them was like a three by, uh, two by three sheet. Uh, it was part of the heat shield and it had a little probe sticking out of it with electronic mechanism on the back. Um, All my neighbors in Dallas this morning heard big booms. How about here? What did it yeah, sound like here? Definitely. It shook the walls. Okay. Well, Peter, um, right now what you've got is many of the people of Nacogdoches, there's a uh, university here, have come down. Some are laying flowers here. I've there's the main church in town is here, and some people are saying a few prayers. Most seem to want to cooperate. They want to help authorities gather as much of this as they can. I know the investigation, they want to get as many pieces. I uh, mentioned to you earlier that some people had mistakenly taken parts home, 
and we're calling in radio stations to say, I can read you the serial number off the back of this. Is that going to help? Mm. And uh, the word they're trying to get out is, don't take it home, leave it where it is. But there are so many pieces, I don't know how they're going to get it all. Thank you, Mike, very much indeed, Mike von Frem and Nakadoshis. But you know, human nature being what it is, item description, bits of machinery were found strewn across the city of Nacogdoches on Saturday, hours after Space Shuttle Columbia broke apart over Texas. Happy bidding. That's on eBay a little while ago. So, as I said, human nature being what it is, somebody, see, people either have taken bits and pieces home and will return it to the authorities. We've heard that from various people phoning in with uh, serial numbers on the individual heat shields because that's so essential. Some tiles have more value than others, we're told. And others, of course, uh, Putting it or not putting it, maybe a scam, who knows, putting it on, uh, putting it on eBay. We were talking a moment ago about the, um, the fact, that we've talked many times today, about the fact that this was a scientific uh, shuttle in, in so many ways. And in the, in the press kit which uh, NASA put out for STS-107, this mission, there are a huge number uh, of experience in the biological field, in the biomedical research and countermeasures experiments field in earth and space sciences in the physical sciences in space product development i'm not going to read them all to you but may come to that um in uh, under space product development there's a long history of uh, of, of uh, business and government sending products into space to see how they react and and interreact in in a weightless atmosphere and here's uh, uh, and it's now called astroculture in one cases and the there's a whole study being done of water fire suppression experiment uh, in space and and growing crystals in space which has always um, been the case so there's a huge and what what I bring it up now less to, to talk about the science of it but if you recall when when Challenger went up and disaster there were school children all over America who were so extraordinarily identified with Krista McAuliffe the first teacher in space that it just connected the society in, in a lot of different ways and it is true in all those high schools and universities and scientific labs around the country where people had a, an interest in this particular mission that was very personal very direct in ways the rest of us would not know incidentally NASA has been talking again of course about putting uh, another teacher into space Krista McAuliffe left a tremendous legacy in terms of enthusiasm for space, in terms of education, enthusiasm for teachers and the whole learning process that occurs in space. And so NASA has wanted another teacher to go into space and there have been any number of journalists who've wanted to go into space. Um, and uh, we haven't had one as yet. Terry Moran is at the White House. Terry, you can bring us up to date on the president. A little bit, Peter. Uh, the president, on returning to the White House, has made a series of phone calls to accept condolences and maybe a little bit more in this moment. Uh, he spoke with uh, Prime Minister Sharon. He placed that call to express condolences to the United States for the loss of the Israeli citizen on board. He also spoke with President Fox, who had called to express condolences, but he spoke with President Chirac of France and President Putin of Russia as well uh, on this day, and with uh, Prime Minister Chrétien of France. And so the president. Uh, we are told the purpose of all those calls was condolences. When asked specifically if the question of Iraq came up with President Chirac and Putin, uh, the official that we talked to said the purpose was condolences, so not ruling it out. I also have a little bit uh, of news for you on what the president told the families in a conference call he put to them when they were gathered in a conference room in the Kennedy Center. Uh, he said, I want the loved ones to know that there are millions of Americans praying for you, including Laura and me. And he concluded that call saying, I wish I was there to hug and cry and comfort you right now. And then had to uh, leave the Oval Office, apparently, to compose himself for a minute or so uh, after making that call. I'm not at all surprised, Terry. Thanks very much, Terry Moran, at the White House. Uh, it just, it, it is just impossible to underestimate uh, or overestimate, I'm not quite sure what it is, the, the extraordinary connection that a president makes under these circumstances with people who have suffered. It is as clear to some of us uh, involved in this today, as clear as anything, uh, the day that President Reagan went to Houston uh, to comfort the families of the astronauts who were lost in the Challenger disaster. And when President Clinton went out to Oklahoma City and spent an entire day, said he wouldn't leave 
uh, this great auditorium in, in, uh, in Oklahoma City until he had spoken intimately with anybody in that town and city who wanted to see him be touched by him. And you have it again with President Bush now. It goes with, uh, it goes with the presidency um, and its enormous power of leadership and all sorts of other things, but it's, uh, it's extraordinary in terms of, of comfort. This is what President Reagan said at the time. It's it. We were comparing this morning a little bit of what uh, President Bush said, and we'll have to get a transcript of that again, of what President Bush said about touching the boundaries of space and how people had made this commitment and how they had been recognized by their maker, as the President put it, I think. And it was President, I said we'd look up what Mr. Clinton had said. Uh, and he said, among other things, the frontier is space and the boundaries of human knowledge. Sometimes when we reach for the stars, we fall short quoting President Reagan now, but we must pick ourselves up again and press on despite the pain. Our nation is indeed fortunate that we can still draw on immense reservoirs of courage, character, and fortitude. And, and yes, is the, uh, this, is the, this is the great phrase which people remembered. We can find consolation only in faith, for we know in our hearts that you who flew so high and so proud now make your home beyond the stars, safe in God's promise of eternal life. And from President Bush this morning, very much the same kind of language. In the skies today, we saw destruction and tragedy, and yet further than that, we can see there is comfort and hope. And then he quoted Isaiah. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens who created all these. He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. The same creator who names the stars also knows the names of the seven souls we mourn today. I tell you, President Bush should be doing this, not me. We can play that tape again. The crew of the shuttle Columbia did not return safely to Earth, the president said, yet we can pray that all are safely home. And Terry Moran saying that he's had contact with the families and then quite understandably went off to be by himself for just a moment because it is very difficult. Andy Card, his chief of staff, uh, we mentioned earlier, had the one uh, the person who told the president at Florida that the terrorists had flown into the trade towers. This is before what happened at the Pentagon and he was watching TV again today and the shuttle was on its approach and he saw this happen actually in the situation room and was then able to go directly to the president and see what he had seen and we got these very early extraordinary pictures again making us putting us in touch with something as these various long-range cameras that our television affiliates in texas in this case have used to track the shuttle because it's a huge you know, local story in Houston, and it's a huge local story in Florida because Houston is the home of so much that is associated with NASA. And therefore, we were all of us able to watch these pieces of the space shuttle now that we know that it broke up and may have begun to break up over California as it streaked down through the atmosphere, causing not one but a a series of sonic booms that we didn't understand at first when people said they'd heard not one but several from downtown Dallas. And, and Jim Oberg, of course, pointing out to us elementary science that it takes several minutes for the sound to descend from 200,000 feet up. And they came in a series. And people who had become so accustomed to the sonic boom uh, around uh, Dallas and also around Houston suddenly heard something they had not heard before and looked up and saw something they had not seen before and would not want to see again. George Stephanopoulos in Washington. George. Well, Peter, I was just thinking as you were reading all the comments from uh, the various presidents at times of tragedy, how big a part, as you said, of the president's job it is now to be a comforter and chief. And maybe it was something foreordained. Um, in, in the way our country was founded, we wanted to walk away, obviously, from a monarchy, the British monarchy. But in, but in having a single president, that person immediately became both the head of government and the head of state and the man the one man uh, who symbolizes uh, the unity of the country and this is a critically important job uh, for the president you mentioned president clinton going to oklahoma city on that day george and i, I know I have to send you right like back to i apologize this afternoon's uh, briefing to the nasa uh, briefing here to my left uh, is ron Dittimore. he's the space shuttle program manager and to his uh, 
left is Chief Flight Director Milt Heflin. Uh, I'll have brief uh, ro remarks from both gentlemen, and then we'll throw it open for questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ron. I'm sure you understand how difficult, how difficult time this is for us right now. We're devastated because of the events that unfolded this morning. There's a certain amount of shock in our system because we have suffered the loss of seven family members. And we're learning to deal with that. There's certainly a somber mood in our teams as we continue to try to understand the events that occurred. But our thoughts and our prayers go out to the families of Rick and Willie, David and Kalpana, Michael, Laurel, and Elan. True heroes. And we are suffering for the events that have happened this morning. As difficult as this is for us to do, we wanted to meet with you and be as fair and open with you given the facts as we understand them today. Uh, we will certainly be learning more as we go through the coming hours days and weeks will tell you as much as we know we'll be as honest as we can with you and certainly we'll try to fill in the blanks over the coming days and weeks as difficult um, a situation as this is we are moving forward we have established a number of different teams we have contingency plans for the, just these types of events, though we never expect to use them. We, had, we have implemented these contingency plans. We are preserving data. We are beginning thorough and complete investigations. We are mobilizing our forces, our engineers, our technicians, our safety and quality, our best experts to try and understand what went wrong. I do want to take the time right now and express my appreciation for the tre tremendous number of agencies that are coming to our aid from across the country, both federal, state, and local, that are assisting us in our recovery operations. I also want to express my appreciation to the public for assisting in the recovery, for notifying us of different debris, where, where it is located, that we might get to it as quickly as possible. It's also appropriate that we tell the public to be careful with the debris. What we fly in space is uh, operated in many cases with toxic propellants and some of the debris may be contaminated. So we need to be careful. And we don't wish any harm to come upon anybody that would be honestly seeking to help. At this hour, we have not positively identified any items that we have recovered. Uh, we are staging in an attempt to ensure that all recovered items are managed appropriately. But at this stage, I haven't received any real information on debris uh, or status of crew remains. I can go back to the uh, start of the day filled with excitement and anticipation. Today was a great day to land in the Florida area. We had uh, all positive indications that it was going to be like 
every other day where we have landed in Florida. Good weather, anxious team to welcome a fantastic crew back, families that were excited about welcome, welcoming their loved ones back, and no indications at all of any impending threats to the vehicle. The first indications of a potential problem occurred minutes before 8 o'clock Central Standard Time. The first indications were of the loss of sensors, temperature sensors in the hydraulic systems on the left wing, both the left inboard and left outboard Elevon temperature sensors. They were followed seconds and minutes later by several other problems, including loss of tire pressure indications on the left main gear, and then indications of excessive structural heating. And uh, Mr. Heflin will talk in a minute about uh, some further details. I have to caution you that we cannot yet say what caused the loss of Columbia. It's still very early in our investigation and it's going to take us some time to work through the evidence, the analysis, and clearly understand what the cause was. But what we are doing is we are impounding hardware so that we can preserve evidence. We have stopped processing at the Kennedy Space Center. We are preserving hardware around the country in our different facilities. We are impounding data here that represented the last data that we received from the crew. And we'll, we will be pouring over that data 24 hours a day for the foreseeable future. Again, I express our sadness to the families for their loss. And we'll do our best to answer your questions. Okay. Thanks, Ron Milt. <clears throat> First of all, uh, uh, just some personal uh, observations and comments to begin with. <clears throat> and then I'll review some, uh, some data with you. <clears throat> um, this is a uh, this is a bad day. Um, I'm glad that I work and and live in a country where we have when we have a bad day we go fix it. Um, Ron said we'll fix it. I can talk to you some about uh, uh, what went on in the flight control room with uh, the entry uh, flight control team under the guidance of flight director Leroy Kane. Ron said it was a good day to land. In fact, many of us, as we came in today, were marveling at the fact that Leroy Kane did the ascent as well. and. And probably the most difficult things that we deal with during launch attempts and entries is dealing with the weather, as, as you all are accustomed to. And we marveled and, and felt good about the fact that, you know, launch, we didn't have any weather issues to work. In fact, any weather issues anywhere in the world that we were concerned about. And, and today, it was a very minor thing to talk about, some fog, I believe, but nothing really hard to work. So, as Ron mentioned, this was a fantastic mission and, and just seemed to be coming to the, the right conclusion. Um, just some specifics for you, and bear with me. This is relatively recent, fresh information, and, and as you can imagine, in the next several hours and days, this will be, we'll get closer to, to, to many details, I'm sure. Um, Around 7.53 a.m. Central Time, as Ron mentioned, we saw indication of um, um, off-scale low measure temperature measurements on the left, the inboard 
and outboard uh, hydraulic systems. And, and, and this was loss of the temperature measurement. It wasn't uh, wasn't any indication that it was high or low. We just lost it. Um, about three minutes later, around 7:56 a.m., uh, in the left main gear tire wheel well uh, brake line and, and tire temperatures, there we saw an increase. Now I, I need to tell you that during this time the vehicle was performing fine. We had no indications of any of any problem. Around 7:58 a.m. Central Time, a couple of minutes later. We have what we call bond line temperatures. These are temperature sensors that are embedded in the structure of the vehicle. We have them, we have them all over the orbiter. Um, three of these temperatures on the, again, the left side of the vehicle, um, left wing area, the off scale low reading again. This was not high indication, low indication, but they were, we lost them, we lost their measurements. I don't have the seconds here. Clearly, seconds will play a part in our analysis, but I'm giving this to you at the nearest minute. Around 7.59, then Central Time, um, left inboard and outboard tire temperatures and pressures uh, off-scale low. Um, about eight eight measurements total during that time. One of these, one of these measurements uh, uh, sensed on board by the computers gave the crew um, a message, indication that they could look at on their displays. Um, and they, <clears throat> they I, we think they were acknowledging that measurement that they saw. Again, the vehicle was flying with no problems at that time. And when things like this happen, when a crew gets an alert, it's a, you acknowledge it, they, they recognize, they've seen it, and then we go, we do what we might need to do with it. And as far as I know, that was the last transmission from the crew. I, I can't, I've asked a couple of people, I haven't heard the tapes myself, I, I'm not sure what they, what they said at the time, but they were acknowledging, we believe, that that indication that they'd seen. Then we lost all vehicle data. Um, it looks like it was around, uh, and I apologize, I've got, it looks like my little cheat sheet here doesn't have the last central time on it, and I'm not gonna try to convert it to you at this point, but it's around eight o'clock. Central Standard Time, um, altitude was 207,135 feet and traveling at uh, a Mach of about 18.3. And the flight control team um, during this time, I, again, uh, we lost the data and that's when we be clearly begin to know that We had a bad day. That's all I've got. Okay, thanks. Um, as you can imagine, we have a lot of uh, centers uh, around the agency that are involved today, so we're going to try to limit the questions to one and uh, try to get through as many as we can. I need you guys to do me a favor, and uh, when you raise your hand, wait for a microphone. And please give your name and affiliation first. And we're going to start here in Houston and then uh, go around to the other NASA centers. So uh, let me see a show of hands and we'll try to get somebody to you. Let's start, just start right here on the, along the front row uh, and work this way. Hi, Melissa Jacobs with the Fox News Network. Where will the debris be taken? We haven't uh, yet identified a central location. Uh, part of the activities that, uh, that are ongoing, even at this very moment, is to stage our teams into a location in uh, uh, northeast Texas. Uh, we are still identifying the locations for our teams to, uh, to meet and gather and, and start this process of recovering deb debris. And uh, part of their first activities is to identify the staging area, the collection point, 
of all the debris. So that's some work that's going to be done uh, later on today. The teams are, are, let's see, they're not quite in the air. They're staging right now at the different uh, airports and they're converging on northeast Texas. Uh, and so that's some work that's still uh, in front of us. Okay. Sig Christensen, uh, San Antonio Express News. Um, at this point, uh, what is the status of the shuttle program and particularly the, the upcoming missions are you going to have? Have you decided to uh, put all of those missions uh, on hold and do you have any kind of idea how long the program will be out of service? Well, of course, this thing happened just this morning and, and uh, we, we put in motion uh, some stop work types of activities. As I mentioned earlier, we've, we've uh, minimized our processing at at the Kennedy Space Center so that we don't do anything that might disturb some evidence. Uh, we, we are also slowing down our manufacturing processes in, uh, in a Mashu facility in Louisiana where we manufacture the external tank. We're doing that in different areas around the country for different pieces of hardware. Uh, what this slowdown means as far as the launch schedule is yet to be determined. Um, we also will be having an, uh, an investigative board outside the agency as mentioned earlier by Mr. O'Keefe that will come in and, and, and help resolve the situation to everybody's satisfaction so that we clearly understand what was the root cause of the problem. And once we, once we get on a path of understanding the root cause then we'll be better able to say whether it affects future flights. If we can put, put it off to the side and, and get it narrowed down and say, okay, we understand the root cause, here's the things we do about it or need to do about it, and then accomplish that corrective action on, on the other vehicle flows, then we'll be able to pick up our flight progress again. How long that's going to take, it's too early for me to tell, but uh, I do believe that uh, we'll continue to meet with you and keep you informed of just how this is progressing. Um, I've talked to uh, Mr. Bill Gerstemeyer, who is the program manager for the International Space Station program. They have scheduled a, they had a previously scheduled progress launch tomorrow, uh, and that progress launch will proceed as scheduled. They have reviewed the contents that are going to be shipped to the space station, and those contents are appropriate given the fact that we may not be there for a while. Uh, they have enough consumables, supplies for the crew to go through the latter part of June without having a shuttle visit. So there's some time for us to work through this. Uh, and get back on our schedule and we're just going to have to work through that in the coming days and weeks and we'll keep you informed on, on just the impact to the manifest. But right now, there is a, certainly there is a hold on uh, future flights until we get ourselves established and understand um, the root cause to this disaster. My name is Jenny Blankenship. I'm a reporter with the CBS station in Austin. And um, I was wondering if, if you could explain to, to people who are not from this area really how tight-knit of a community this is, not just here on the NASA JSC campus, but all around here, how much of a, an integral part of the community this is to you all. Well, it's, it's more than a job. This, this is a passion for us. Human spaceflight is a passion. It's an emotional event. Uh, and when we work together, we work together as family members. Um, and, and we treat each other much that way. And whether it's the loss of a crew member or a loss of a member of our ground team or processing teams, it's a sad loss for us. And so we are a very close community. We understand the risks that are involved in human spaceflight. And we know that these risks are manageable, but we also know that they're serious and can have deadly consequences. And so we are bound together with the threat of disaster all the time. And we know we must count on each other 
to do what's right. We must count on the ground teams to process correctly. We must count on our suppliers to follow the procedures just like we have identified to them. And we count on the flight crew members to fly the vehicles within the specifications. So we all rely on each other to make each space flight successful. So we have a dependency. And it's a professional dependency and it's an emotional dependency. And so when we have an event like today where we lose seven family members, it is devastating to us. Uh, and it's more than just us in this location. There, there is an emotional attachment to human space flight. It, it uh, piques our interest, it captures our imagination. Uh, I received a couple of phone calls this morning immediately following uh, immediately following the uh, when it became apparent that Columbia was no longer going to land one phone call was from my brother in Phoenix Arizona not associated with the space business I haven't talked to him yet I just received a message certainly extending his thoughts and prayers. I received another phone call from my son in Provo, Utah with the same emotional outpouring of sadness. And I'm sure this is true across the country. We're seeing that from the public. We're seeing that as people that really care about the space program and understand what it means to this nation reflect their thoughts, their prayers, their caring attitude toward us and, and we want them to know we appreciate it very much. As we struggle with our emotions in this difficult time, we appreciate the thoughts, the prayers, the care, and the support. Milt, you might have some thoughts also. Well, um, yeah, it, it is a, the, the community out here is, is extremely close-knit. Um, <clears throat> I've been through three of these. Um, and, and each time... Uh, you see a coming together of other community here. Our landscape has changed. <clears throat> the space flight business today is not going to be, it's going to be much different than it was yesterday. It was different after the Apollo 1, it was different after Challenger. And it was different because this community and the passion that Ron's right the passion is here and and as Ron was talking I was thinking about your question and I thought you know sometimes it's a shame uh, that it takes things like this for this country to pull together and and, and care and and it shouldn't damn we're good this country's great it shouldn't take these kind of things to cause a coming together. Okay, thanks. Uh, Eric Berger with the Houston Chronicle. Milt, you mentioned about eight sensors and one of those which triggered some kind of notification inside the, inside the shuttle. Um, can you tell us which sensor that was and whether it was an abnormal reading on whatever sensor it was or whether it was just that the sensor was no longer functioning? There were, <clears throat> in the left inboard and outboard, th these, are tire, these are tire temperatures on the left-hand side, okay? Um, um, temps and pressures, and Ron, help me out here if I, if I, if I get that mixed up. Um, and and they, they, all went, they all went what we call off-scale low. In other words, there's a bottom number zero or maybe not zero, not necessarily zero, but there's a bottom number of the measurement. They all just went off scale low, indicating um, loss of the measurement itself. You know, um, and, and I cannot tell you specifically which one of the eight. Uh, we'll find that out, but I don't have that right now. No. An, e an easy way to think about that is the measurement was no longer reading. It was not yeah. giving an indication. It's, it's as if someone just cut the wire. Okay, right over here. Chris Heinbaugh with WFAA-TV in Dallas. Uh, you indicated that at 7.53 was the first, uh, you first lost some sensor uh, information. And you indicated towards the end there was an acknowledgement from the crew. 
during the rest of that time period, was there any dialogue, any communication with the crew during that period? And was, if there was, was there any indication from them uh, that there was a problem uh, that they could see on board? Uh, at, yes, at 7.53 a.m., uh, we did have a, another set of um, four measurements uh, in the hydraulic system on the left-hand side that went off scale low. Now, this was reported by the um, uh, flight controller responsible for the mechanical and hydraulic systems in the orbit reported to the flight director. Um, w when this happens, then it's followed up by if there's any action to take, if there's anything that we see that needs to be done, that flight controller will tell the flight director and a crew and, and call might go to the crew. Uh, these were measurements that did not <clears throat> have, um, we, many, we have many measurements on board. Not all of them are enunciated to the crew. They don't need to be. Uh, and we see a lot more information on the ground than they do. So they did not, did not see this. So they had no indication. We saw nothing else to indicate any difficulty at all because had we seen anything else, we would have taken some action. That's, you know, we work, we work very hard. We train very hard to react in a very short amount of time to situations. Um, but we don't, if, if, if we don't have anything that we see that we've got to do, then we don't, we don't spend the time talking about it because we focus on the next event and so forth. Right here next, next to him. I'm Brian Sass for KPRC TV here in Houston. We had heard some reports that <clears throat> during launch there had been some concerns that some debris hit the wing. Uh, is that true and is that any cause of concern and that could have caused today's problems? Uh, it is true that uh, right after launch, and I don't remember the time frame as far as the seconds, there was a, uh, a piece of foam that is used as insulation on the external tank in the area of what we call the uh, bipod, which is the forward attach uh, between the orbiter and the external tank. There is a piece of foam that, uh, that was shed. And in our review the following day of the launch films, we, we saw this piece of debris drop off. And uh, it, it looked to us like it impacted the orbiter uh, on the left wing. Where on the left wing, it's very difficult for us to tell. Uh, somewhere between the mid and outward span. Um, was it the leading edge? We don't know. Was it underneath the leading edge? We really don't know. To the best of our ability, that's what happened. We spent um, a goodly amount of time reviewing that film and then analyzing uh, what that potential impact of debris on the wing might might do and, and would there be any consequences. Uh, through analysis and through our ability uh, 